Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for In Practice, providing in-person services behind bars. My name is Carolina Aparicio, Program Officer at JDI, and I'll be your moderator today. JDI is a health and human rights organization that works to end sexual violence in all forms of detention. We have three core goals. The first is to hold government officials and agencies accountable for sexual abuse in their facilities. Second is to change uh, flippant and ill-informed public attitudes about sexual violence behind bars. And finally, to ensure survivors of prisoner rape get the help that they need. We would like to take a moment to thank the Office on Violence Against Women for its generous support of this webinar and our larger project called No Bad Victims, Support for Incarcerated Survivors. So just a few things before we get started. Um, you can submit questions and comments throughout the webinar using the questions box on the right side of your screen, and you can see um, a demonstration of it up here on your screen. Um, this webinar is being recorded, and a link to the recording will be emailed to you um, later today um, or where you can access it, um, along with a link to the evaluation. Um, and just to note that the recording will be closed captioned. This webinar will also be posted on the JDI website. Please make a note of the link on the screen. This webpage also hosts all of our previous webinars, um, about a dozen or more, and a lot more resources for advocates. And we'll go over that at the end of today's webinar. This webinar is the fourth in our series and aims to help community-based rape crisis organizations and other service providers like yourselves understand the issues facing survivors in adult and juvenile detention. Today's webinar will focus on the logistics of providing in-person services to incarcerated survivors. Um, today we'll cover the following. How to set up in-person services at a prison jail or youth facility. Ways to maintain confidentiality and work within facility rules. We'll cover tips for entering a facility and troubleshooting once you're inside. We'll have a discussion with two advocates about their own in-person counseling program at several Miami-Dade jails, and we'll end with ample time for questions and answers. Just a quick note on some terms before we move on. We'll use the terms victim and survivor interchangeably through, during this webinar and during all of our other webinars. Um, JDI use, uses the term survivor to describe someone who's been sexually abused. We do this to honor the strength and resiliency it takes to live through a sexual assault and for that person to heal. Law enforcement, prosecutors, and victims' rights groups tend to use the term victim in recognition of the crime that was committed. We'll use the terms inmates, residents, and detainees um, today to refer to incarcerated people. The term inmate is used in the in the Prison Rape Elimination Act, or PREA, standards to refer to people detained in a prison or jail. Resident is used for persons confined to a community confinement facility or a juvenile facility. And detainee is a term that's used for a person who's been arrested by a law enforcement officer and is detained in a lockup. If you have any questions about a specific term or any questions about anything at all today, please use the questions box on the right side of your screen and, um, and I'll be responding. Um, so before we dive into some of the more practical material today, um, I wanted to share a survivor story with you. Frank, who's pictured here, is a member of JDI's Survivor Council, and um, I'm going to read part of his testimony. In 2006, I lost my job at a law firm and was arrested for public drunkenness. I had never been arrested before. I was scared of other inmates. I did not know at the time that I had, I had more reason to fear the staff. At the Los Angeles County Jail, I disclosed to the officers that I was gay and that I had never been to jail. Rather than protecting me, the officers taunted me and nothing I did would make them leave me alone. After one particularly humiliating incident, I spoke up. In response, one of the officers threatened to hurt me. I had no idea he would actually carry out those threats and get away with it. A day or two after I was threatened, the officer in the watchtower left, and it got eerily quiet. That's when the abusive officer entered my cell, 
beat me and raped me. When the officer on the next shift saw me naked and bloody to my cell, he asked what had happened. I told him I was raped and he just told me to get dressed but never followed up on my report. I was denied a forensic exam, which made it impossible to collect evidence. No one provided me with any treatment for my injuries, even though I was badly beaten. I never spoke with a counselor or mental health staff member and was left to suffer alone in my cell. I know that if I, if I had had an advocate, it would have saved me so much grief. Going through it alone, I didn't know who I could trust and who I could talk to about it, which appeared to be nobody. So sadly, we know that Frank's story isn't rare. Um, there are thousands of people who are sexually abused behind bars every year who don't get the help that they need to heal. Access to rape crisis services can be one of the single most important factors in prisoner rape survivors healing. If you aren't there for, for these survivors, who will be? So. Now we want to, we would like to hear from you, who, uh, from all of you who are listening. Um, for those of you who have not worked directly with incarcerated survivors, please think for a moment about some of the challenges you could foresee. What are your concerns about providing in-person services to prisoners? And then for those of you who have provided these services or worked with incarcerated survivors, what were some of your biggest challenges? Please submit them and um, submit your answers by typing it into the questions box, and I'll just give you a minute for that. I have concerns about confidentiality, safety issues, lack of training, um, lack of privacy with corrections officers, um, mandated reporting issues, safety, privacy for the inmate, challenge being cleared to enter the prison, um, lots of cultural competency, logistics. So a lot of these um, clear clear boundaries. We're getting a lot of great great answers and. Honestly, they're really common concerns, corrections officer attitudes, retaliation to the inmate for seeking services, resources. So it sounds like you all are, are seeking a lot of great, um, or seeking answers today. And I hope that um, a lot of what we cover today will, uh, will answer some of that, some of your concerns. So common concerns we've heard um, from lots of folks in the field, fears about one's own safety. Um, Many of you fear for your own safety, of course, or that of your colleagues when working with incarcerated survivors. Um, many of you may fear for your own safety. Um, you may also worry about difficult or challenging corrections staff, so some of these attitudes that a lot of you were bringing up, including differing understandings of confidentiality. And so we'll definitely go into that um, in detail today. And then finally, how to provide services in a very um, restrictive environment, of, such as a prison, jail, or a lockup. Um, and hopefully we'll address most of these today, including some examples later from um, Jamie and Eleanor, our guest speakers. So thank you for that. Um, I'd now like to introduce you to Linda McFarland, one of JDI's Deputy Executive Directors, who will go over some of the logistics of providing in-person services behind bars, including how to set up your programs, troubleshooting, and tips for working in facilities. Uh, to Linda is a licensed clinical social worker with decades of experience working with survivors of sexual abuse in various settings. She's also worked in a youth corrections facility as a custody staff. Um, Linda has provided training to thousands of rape crisis counselors and corrections officials on providing services to incarcerated survivors. Welcome, Linda. Thanks so much, Carolina. Um, we're going to turn now to reviewing some of the setup work and planning that needs to be done for in-person services in a detention facility. During our last webinar on the inside, we went over a memoranda of understanding or written agreements in some great detail, and that webinar is available on our Advocates resource page as our sample MOUs for you to take a look at. So specifically thinking about when developing your MOU for in-person services, it's important to start with who is eligible for your services. Throughout this webinar, I'll make the point, and, and Jamie and Eleanor later will as well, that it's always important to go back to your policies and practices for any survivors. What are those agencies' policies, practices, procedures related to other survivors? Who's eligible for services in your agency, and how do you make 
the decision that someone is or is not. The process for incarcerated survivors really can and should be quite similar. It's important to decide ahead of time how many sessions you can provide inside the facility and again how you're going to make that decision. Will you offer follow-up services only? Um, will they be short-term or long-term? Are you going to do groups? What's available to survivors in the community? Start with that as your base point. Consider your the distance to the facility, your resources, the needs of the survivors that you're seeing, of course. And if a survivor needs more sessions because, say, they're going through an investigation or trial related to the sexual assault, how are you going to make that decision that this is someone who needs more, se more sessions? Think about will the services be available for people who reported abuse inside the facility as the, well as those who didn't. Remember that just like in the community, most survivors, again, wherever they live, don't report. So it's important to think about how to negotiate seeing people who have not reported. It's also important to have a plan for providing services to survivors of previous trauma. When I was doing face-to-face -face counseling inside a men's prison, about half of my clients had been sexually abused before they were incarcerated. And you'll also hear from Eleanor and Jamie later about similar experiences. Rape crisis centers do generally provide services to survivors of abuse from at any time in their lives, and incarcerated survivors do have those very same needs. Moving on to thinking about, let's figure out how people are going to request services. And that's, that's a really important first step and, and will definitely require some negotiation and sensitivity around those conversations with the facility. Some of the mechanisms that have worked um, in other programs are referrals from mental health staff. Mental health staff and facilities are often really overburdened, have very high caseloads, and might be extremely relieved to have professionals with expertise in sexual assault to make referrals to. A mental health staff member should, should be a part of the response team in the facility, and th this is going to be an important contact person for you as well. But remember that facility mental health staff are usually not able to provide the same level of confidentiality as community-based counselors, so your services really do have a different function here. And I should note that if you're working in a small facility, there may not even be regular mental health services available. Investigators inside the corrections facilities, just like law enforcement in the community, uh, should know and be really comfortable with the information about available services and able to make those referrals. In all of the counseling programs about which I'm aware, facility investigators have really played quite an important role. In fact, in the program that I worked in in California state prisons, the lead investigators were also the people who would make referrals for survivors who had not reported. If your agency hotline is available to prisoners, request through the hotline, just like in the community or in other ways survivors might ask for help. Certainly confidential written request forms can be useful, and they may be the way prisoners will be the most comfortable requesting services. So it will be important to ask your facility how can inmates make written requests that have some confidentiality around them. It might be possible to develop your own confidential written request form, and in several of the programs that JDI has been involved in developing, there's a specific request form that can be turned into either a designated person or a mailbox, no questions asked. And finally, during a forensic medical exam, of course, um, the agency that's providing hospital accompaniment may get a request for that person from follow-up services. And if that's a different agency than can provide in-person services in the facility, then you should have those cross-referrals available. I think we say again and again on, on these webinars discussing working inside facilities that getting to know the facility is incredibly important. And so in this case, part of your purpose of a tour or getting to know is to look for where are you going to meet with people. Um, think about different security levels and, and it's true that in different units that have different security levels, where you meet with people and physically how you meet with them is going to vary a little bit and Jamie and Eleanor are going to talk about that more too. So early on, 
in that tour, getting to know the facility, look for what, where are the meeting rooms. And you could think about an attorney room, counseling room, or even or a classroom as some possibilities. One of the things to note here is checking in about video and audio monitoring. Very often in meeting rooms there will be video monitoring. Usually that's not also audio, but it might be. So you should definitely check on that. And really, if you can, the meetings where the rooms where they meet with attorneys could work the best because they do facilities have to provide a private space for people to meet confidentially with their attorneys. It's also good to have a plan B room or a backup room in case you arrive and the room that you usually use is being used for something unexpected. In, when Carolina asked a moment about go about your concerns, background checks and security clearances were brought up, and I'm, I was glad to hear that. And it's an important step here. You need to know what's the background check and security clearance process. Make sure you complete that before you plan to start services, and also get get an idea for how long it's going to take you to get into the facility. Some larger prisons, for example, there's quite a process to get in. Some smaller jails I've done some work in, you basically meet your contact person and walk in, and there isn't a lengthy process. So get to know the facility where you're doing the work. I can't stress enough the importance of getting to know the facility rules and participating potentially in an orientation for volunteers if that's available. So what rules, what are the ones you need to learn is there an orientation class or meeting that you can attend or even written documentation? All facilities do have a lot of rules and a lot of structure, so it's important before entering a facility that you know what they are. Um, attending the orientation that they provide for volunteers is a good idea both for your own safety and comfort, but it also might help facility staff feel more comfortable with you being inside because you know their expectations. The importance of that facility point person can't be overstated either. Get to know the person, their concerns, develop a way that you're going to work together. Because this is the person that you can go to for troubleshooting and to help you meet the needs of your clients. Just like your room, though, have a, have a plan B or a second point person in case you arrive and your usual person has been called away for some reason. Right, confidentiality was brought up quite a bit in in the concerns that you all submitted a little bit ago, and and it is perhaps the most critical and thorniest piece to work out. So, spell out the details of your agency and your state requirements around confidentiality in your memorandum of understanding or your written agreement. Be prepared to engage in challenging conversations about this with the facility staff. One important point here to remember is that the rape crisis counselor or advocate will always have an obligation to maintain confidentiality unless there is a clear, legally defined reason to break it. On the flip side, corrections staff approach, often approach confidentiality from the opposite direction with the perspective that everything should be reported unless there's some clear reason not to. And both of these perspectives are legitimate given the professional roles of the people who hold them, and they can also coexist, but it does take some negotiating and some cross-training. It's really not unlike building a relationship with a new law enforcement agency in a SART. So for the advocates, talk about the importance and the significance of confidentiality and the reasoning behind it for rape crisis services. Remember that correction staff may be legitimately concerned that if the survivor can talk to you confidentially, he or she not, may not report. And their legitimate concern is that their job is to keep the facility safe. So if they don't have information, they feel they can't do it. But talk to them about the fact that survivors who have confidential support are more likely to report and more likely to stick with an investigation if they do report. You could also point out that every other person the survivor comes in contact with on a daily basis is a mandated reporter of any crimes that occur within the facility. So there's ample opportunity if the survivor wants to report. Having access to one confidential source of support will not mean they're less likely to report overall. Your, your informed consent form should be quite detailed, and we'll go over um, that in some detail later in the webinar. Um, 
release of information is important. Part of the reason this the, your, a release of information that is two-way both gives you permission to speak to a named and specific person at the facility. So someone who has the power to say change their housing or check on them if you're concerned about their safety. Um, but also then gives you permission to receive information as well, say from mental health staff or housing staff. This is another place where you can go back to your policies and procedures for other survivors and adapt it as needed. And your release of information really should be essentially the same. But one benefit of the release of information here is that it, it will really reinforce to your clients that your services actually are confidential. On that note, so adapting and looking at all of your um, counseling forms and materials is going to be an important. The con informed consent form, there might be some differences around the limitations of confidentiality. And I'm speaking specifically about in one facility where I did some work and it was determined that a detailed escape plan, because of how the facility would respond to escape attempt, would qualify as a risk to self. So, to, to self. So we'd have to break confidentiality. Essentially, it was placed in the same category as a suicide plan. This really, this was the only difference, and, and that's kind of the only place where I've seen a difference in terms of limits of confidentiality. Other than that, it should be the same. Again, the release of information should be clear, and um, take a look at your intake form. You may need to adapt it. You may not. Your assessment of trauma symptoms, if you do one when you first begin counseling, um, looking at the way it's important to take a look at it again and see how de healing from dealing with trauma is both very similar and a bit different behind bars. Survivors might face daily triggers that can be overstimulating, overwhelming. Um, they're also very likely to be in contact with the per perpetrator, specifically if they haven't made a report. And another note is that the level of lack of control that survivors have over their lives is very intense inside of a facility. So take these things into account in your um, assessment. So again, as always, it's important to get feedback from your clients just like you would in the community. Look at what's working, what's not about the program, and make adjustments as needed. Another thing I think that um, prisoners will be extremely grateful to be asked for their opinion about how your program is working, and that's certainly been my experience. A question often comes up about se session notes. Do they become part of the prison record? Do they, where, where are they housed? How does that all work? It should definitely be worked out ahead of time where they'll be kept, how they're kept, and who's safeguarding them. The, the bottom line really here is that they, it should be the same as your other counseling notes. Notes should be completed and filled out and, and housed, filed at the Rape Crisis Center in a secure fireproof location just like you would your other records. Facility staff members, medical and mental health providers at the prison or jail or youth facility shouldn't have any more access to session notes than for those of a survivor from, say, the community, a drug treatment center, a school, or someone in the military. Um, the point is you are working for your agent agency and doing the work inside the facility, not working for the facility. So let's take a look in some more detail at an informed consent form. Um, this is a sample here. It's available on the Advocate Resources page of JDI's website. I'm going to go over, I'm just going to pick out a few aspects to go over in some more detail. Spell out how many sessions. This one says up to 10 sessions. In this case, that was based on the community standard of the center that was providing the services. And it's here just as an example. Look at what specific services you actually can provide. Making clear that your services are independent of those at the prison, as I mentioned a minute ago. Survivors who are incarcerated may have to see this in writing. And I, I certainly found that this helped with building trust. Building trust that the services are independent and confidential takes more time with incarcerated survivors. It's always important to highlight both the benefits and the risks of services, namely that there could be an increase in symptoms or anxiety at first. Many people haven't ever had the opportunity to receive services before and they might not know that. Um, so it's important to point that out. 
Be very specific about what services you can and cannot provide. Incarcerated survivors are very likely to ask you for other requests, like general therapy, medical help, or legal advice, right? They have limited access to other resources while they're inside, so they're quite likely to make other requests of you because you're there, right? So go back and think about how do you handle other requests, off-topic requests from other survivors. You deal with that anyway. You're often the only free services available in the community, so you, you know how to do this. Set limits. Make it clear that, there are, that these are crisis counseling services about healing from sexual abuse. And if someone can't participate in those services because of other things that are more pressing from them, you can of course make referrals and offer to resume sessions when they're ready. Also make clear that participation is voluntary. Incarcerated survivors might not know that, particularly if they were referred by a staff member at the facility or participating in an investigation. Right, legal and ethical considerations section where you lay out your boundaries and a note about confidential record keeping is important. Make sure you set clearly the limitations of a professional relationship. This is for your protection, it's also for the client's protection, and it's for the facility as well to be more comfortable and in understanding and getting that these are professional services. Um, Jamie and Eleanor will talk about this again in a little bit as well, but that very often the corrections staff might not be um, familiar with rape crisis services, might not know what your role is, and so setting out that this is a professional relationship that you're familiar with keeping boundaries will be helpful for everybody. Some things might be slightly different from your general informed consent form, and an example here is what you will or will not bring in or take out of the facility. Again, something that should be laid out here that you might not talk about in a community consent form. Limits of confidentiality are always a you know sort of fundamental part of an informed consent form. Write it out in detail, make it very clear, offer your client um, the opportunity to ask questions about what this means and what would that look like. Um, for the most part, as you can see for many of you, they'll look the same. So get to know your own agency policy, review state and local guidelines, mandatory reporting guidelines. Emphasize to the facility and, and sort of reconfirm for yourself that your legal obligations to clients don't change based on where your client lives. Um, I've found that a great many people don't know that adults have the right to decide whether or not a police report is filed when they're the victim of the crime themselves, and you might have to explain that. It's definitely something I've found many corrections officials not to know. They assume that as a counselor, if I hear of a crime, I have to report it. And so again, going back to when, work, when setting this up, working with the reasoning for behind that, and you'll see... Um, here as well, the added, you report that you intend to escape the institution was added to this one, again, because of the way that specific facility responded to escape attempts. Again, this, that, the, confidence, the informed consent form we just reviewed is available at our website, and um, you, you can feel free to review it. You can also um, send us questions with specifics about it, either here through the webinar chat box or at our email address that we'll give at the end. So it's important to think about how will you work with survivors who have not and do not want to report. Figure out how they're going to request services and set up appointments. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, work out ahead of time with your point person how everyone's going to get to the counseling room. The program that I worked in developed several ways for survivors who had not reported to request the services. The survivor could request to see the counselor through a facility mental health staff member or the lead investigator, neither of whom would ask follow-up questions. Survivors could also write a letter to the rape crisis counselor or um, write a note that was delivered to a private mailbox at the prison that only the counselor checked. They could, um, 
it's important to build these relationships with your partners at the facility so that you can have sensitive conversations about some of these issues and even disagreements about them without jeopardizing the program. So talk with your point people, um, the people who might pass on requests for services to you about not asking for more information when someone requests an appointment. They may be asking for sessions regarding something that happened when they were a child, for example, and that's not something that they need to disclose to the facility. If they do ask questions, remind them of, um, of the confidentiality guidelines or make sure you're prepared to give a somewhat vague answer that doesn't violate confidentiality. Remember that you might have an escort to the counseling room. Um, in some larger facilities you probably will, in higher security facilities you will. In lower security facilities you, you might not and you may be free to move about the facility yourself once you're comfortable. But be prepared to talk with the security staff that you come in contact with about why you're there. So what do you do if a staff member won't let you see the survivor unless you tell them what the conversation's about? I, you know, I can't let you in this room with this prisoner until you tell me what it's about. So work out what you'll say ahead of time. I'd also work with your point person on determining this. You could say that you're working with investigators, that you're here to do interviews, and honestly what I used to always do was name my point person. I'm here working with Sergeant Smith today. If you have any questions, you can follow up with him and leave it at that. That, that was usually quite effective. Staff will get to know who you are and why you're there, and, and honestly, they'll probably call you the PREA person, um, in which case you might be able to avoid questions and, again, say, I'm, I'm here just to do some interviews or sessions today. Another question that's come up sometimes is what if the facility won't let you see a client because they believe the person is lying for some reason. Maybe there was an investigation and it was unsubstantiated or unfounded. I would go back for you for your own sort of setting your limits, go back to the community standard. Rape crisis centers do not care about the status of an investigation, how a report came out, right? We understand that many cases that survivors report rested unsubstantiated or may even be um, unfounded. So this is another point where pre-planning and your point person are important. Explain the purpose of your services and also that you may not, you may be seeing someone because they made a report, but you may move on to work on previous trauma issues with that person, in which case, again, the status of their report really doesn't matter. So you also may have to educate people about what substantiated means and why the person might still need the counseling services. If you do ever feel afraid or threatened, um, this is another place we're going to go back to pre-planning and perhaps the volunteer orientation. Your point person should give you some clear instructions about how they're going to safeguard you know, your safety while you're there and how, what you should do if you ever do feel threatened. So talk with your point person about that. They might give you a personal alarm or a whistle, show you how to set off an alarm if you need it, talk to you about the room you're meeting in and where perhaps you should sit as opposed to where your client should sit. Um, so again, work that out so you have as clear a plan as you can beforehand. And if something does happen within the context of your session where you're feeling afraid, again, go back to your, your personal alarm, your whistle, or your ability. Make sure you have an ability to exit the room. I will say honestly, in all of the times that I have done counseling sessions within facilities, I have never, never felt threatened by my client. Um, and actually, Eleanor will talk a little bit later about how she handled a time when she was feeling somewhat uncomfortable. Also ask ahead of time for instructions about what you should do if there's a lockdown or other critical incident while you're in the institution so that you make sure you have instructions. And then if the survivor discloses to you that he or she is in danger from another staff member or from another inmate, um, I would work with your client around a safety plan just as you would with other clients and perhaps talk with them about if there is somebody at the facility that they feel safe with you disclosing that to and get a release of information.
In a um, previous webinar, also on the inside, we did talk at, in more length about safety planning, and there's a section on safety planning also in our Advocates Resource Manual that's available at our website. Right, before you actually walk inside the facility, find out anything you can about dress code limitations. You don't want to show up and find out that you're wearing the wrong color or the wrong clothing. Some places do have limitations around certain colors and, um, and types of clothing, say like tank tops or lower cut shirts, shorts, open-toed shoes. So find out about those things. Also check in what you can and cannot bring in. Many places you can't bring a large purse, and going through that could cause a delay. Um, certainly computers or tablets may not be allowed, but find out that. So really I would stick to formal, to business casual dress. Um, super formal, like three-piece suits, might be, seem too professional for the environment and be a little bit alienating. So I'd say business casual and best practice would bring to be bring just a notebook and any counseling materials, your pen or pencil, and your ID. The simpler you can keep it, the fewer problems you'll encounter. Be prepared for the security checks, um, either first coming in and then potentially from unit to unit, which might take some time. And to that end, have your staff point person's contact information at your fingertips so that if your questions why you're at the front gate or moving from a unit to a unit, for example, you can always just say that that's who you're here to see and that's who you're working with and contact them um, to help you get where you need to get. Your safety, and I found this again and again, your safety really will be the facility's number one priority during your visit. The last thing they want is for a visitor from the community, a service agency, to feel unsafe while they're working in their facility. I'm just going to quickly review some of the tips we've talked about to sort of solidify them. So once you're inside the facility, Prepare for delays. Schedule time between your sessions, because especially if you're moving unit to unit, you don't know how long it's going to take, and you also don't always know how long it's going to take them to get your next client to you. As much as you can, plan for emergencies. Rather, expect them would be a be better way to put that. Expect disruptions in your services. There, there might be an alarm. There might be um, some other medical appointment that your client got assigned for, they might all of a sudden be doing GED testing in the room where you normally meet people. So expect that. And that's where all your plan Bs come in. Acknowledge and be respectful towards security staff. Answer their questions as best as you can with respect that their jobs are difficult and they're, they're there to help keep everybody safe. To that end, maintain professional working relationships with both prisoners and staff. Um, again, while always keeping the bottom line that you're an advocate for survivors. Follow rules around the contact with prisoners. There may be rules around personal contact like shaking hands or even being physically close. That's something, again, I'd talk through with your point person, but generally a best practice would be to keep a professional sort of personal space difference and distance rather and, and not, not physically touch your clients in this setting. Patience and flexibility are definitely the keys um, to doing this work. Make your appointments ahead of time and also call to confirm them before you arrive so that you can find out if, for example, you're not going to be get, able to get into the facility today. Also have a mechanism to inform your clients if you can't come in that day for some reason. And then also check in with your contact person before you start your day. Talk about where you're going to be, how you're going to get from place to place, and then also make sure you let them know before you leave. Once you're moving around inside the facility, something we've really, really seen is that the presence of rape crisis advocates inside a corrections facility changes the culture. And so it's important that people know who you are, why you're there, that their facility is committed enough to preventing, detecting, and responding to sexual abuse and sexual harassment that they've invited an outside advocate in to do services. So talk about what rape crisis services are, but also then have a plan to explain who you are if someone asks you specifically about one of your clients, 
without breaking confidentiality. So this is a sort of delicate balance with they need to know why you're there and what your services are, but you also need to make sure that your, um, your confidentiality of your clients is maintained. Find as well both some of the obvious allies like mental health staff or the Prison Rape Elimination Act coordinator at the facility. Um, but also there might be some unlikely allies, like some of the security staff. Some of the people, when I've been doing this work, that have perhaps seemed the most resistant at first, often turned out to be the strongest supporters once they understand that everybody has the same goals. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, so just before we move on to our conversation with um, Jamie and Eleanor, I just want to remind everyone to submit any questions you have at all, questions, comments, um, through the questions box, and uh, just so we can kind of start looking at them and thinking about them um, ahead of the Q&A after our conversation. So now that we know about some of the logistics of setting up in-person services in corrections facilities, um, I'd like to invite two advocates, Jamie Naren and Eleanor Weeks, to talk about their experiences working in several jails in Miami, Florida. Um, they've both been, uh, they've both provided in-person counseling to survivors in a program with JDI for the past, um, for close to two years now. Jamie has worked with survivors of sexual abuse for the past 20 years. She began her work as a family therapist at the Children's Hospital Guidance Center in Columbus, Ohio, where she worked with children who were victims of crime. Jamie worked at the Nancy J. Cotterman Center in Fort Lauderdale, Florida for seven years, providing intensive individual family and group counseling to children, adolescent, and adult victims of sexual abuse. Jamie is currently working full-time as a crisis counselor on, our, on the project um, with JDI and Miami-Dade Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, where she provides direct crisis counseling, advocacy, and trauma-informed care to survivors of sexual violence who are incarcerated. And she provides these services in two of MDCR's large jails. Eleanor is a licensed mental health counselor in the state of Florida. She worked for 12 years at the Nancy J. Cotterman Center in Fort Lauderdale, providing individual, group, and family counseling to survivors of sexual violence. Eleanor is, skilled, is a skilled child forensic interviewer and conducted forensic interviews for uh, the Nancy J. Cotterman Center for children with special needs and children suspected of child-on-child -child sexual abuse. She's worked for seven years writing comprehensive behavioral health assessments for children in dependency. Eleanor works part-time as a crisis counselor on the project with JDI and the MDCR and, uh, prov and is providing, provides these services in the Miami-Dade jails at Pretrial Detention Center, Metro West Detention Center, and Boot Camp. Um, so Jamie and Eleanor, can you tell us a little bit about uh, about uh, the services you provide to survivors at the Miami-Dade jails and how you structure your counseling sessions? Um, hi, yes, yeah, sure. One of the facilities I work in is TGK facility, which has over a thousand beds. I generally will start my first session by explaining to the client exactly what I do, why we're there, and talk about confidentiality in detail. I think explaining that is so important in order to build trust, and rapport, and so they have, a, have the right understanding and expectations. I make it clear that I don't work for the institution. I share JDI's Hope for Healing booklet, which gives them a little information about typical reactions of sexual abuse. We use the inform, um, consent form that Linda just went over, and I usually go over that with a client in the first session as well. I try to leave it at that for the first session, not to overwhelm the client. Yeah, and during the second session, we do uh, the trauma analysis with the client, and we try to set, you know, at least three goals that they want to achieve during the counseling, and, and we also review their history with them. You know, I let them know that, that I'll take, I'll need to take some notes, but that, you know, we can review them afterwards, and, you know, I feel that it helps to build trust with them, and then by the third session, we come up with a treatment plan that's more specific um, for each client that we're working with. Great, and, and how have your clients responded to these services? Um, generally, I found that people are very eager to participate, but they have no idea what to expect because they've never had treatment before. Most of our clients have been victimized their whole lives, but they have never received help to deal with the trauma. 
I found that many of our clients have experienced sexual abuse as children and as adults. That's probably why they're incarcerated for the first time, for the first place. But their often issues are trust, probably due to their incarceration and life experiences. You know, I, I think that the, the counseling services they're getting from us is, is usually the first time that many of the incarcerated survivors have really been able to assess what works for them and, and how to heal from their lifelong trauma. You know, I help them look at this as a, as a possibly a positive time and, and that they can use this time to get stable and, and to get help. They're so grateful to have someone listening who treats them with dignity and respect. They always want more and they're always eager to learn. Um, and I also encourage them to continue services after they've been discharged. Thank you. Um, I know that many of our listeners, as, as they mentioned earlier when we um, asked the question about concerns, um, are expressed, expressed that they're a fear about their own safety when working with this population of survivors. Um, have, have you, Eleanor, have you ever felt concerned about your own safety? You know, I have never felt unsafe or, un or threatened. I, I think that it helps with establishing rapport with the clients. You know, my, you know how I, you know, kind of react or act with them. I work a lot in the psych ward of the pretrial detention center, which is the main jail in Miami. And the inmates there wear either orange or red uniform. It's based on either the severity of their illness or of their crime. And they're always in handcuffs and shackled to the wall during our sessions. In the beginning, you know, I always ask the staff if, if they would take them off, but that's their procedure in the jail, so I try to just make the best of it. You know, I talk with my clients about it, and, and we, you know, we just have an understanding that this is what we have to do in order for them to get services. You know, if I refuse to see the person without the shackles, then that would be one less survivor that would, you know, would not get services. Uh, I don't think that the clients ever think that I feel threatened by them. It's it's just something that we have to do. They have to be handcuffed. And despite all that, I've, I've really never felt concerned about my safety. There's always a corrections officer who's outside the interview room. And uh, the corrections officers, they're very concerned about my safety, too. Thank you. I mean, I think, I think as Linda mentioned earlier, really every time we've gone in, it's been sometimes the staff have been more, more worried about our safety than, than we have. So <laughs> I think that's, um, you know, hopefully that, that reassures people. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the impact of mental illness and, um, and also medication on your sessions with your clients? Jamie? Oh, yeah, sure. So many of our clients have been previously diagnosed with severe mental illnesses like bipolar, but they've never followed through with any of their treatment. Now that they're incarcerated, they're placed on medication for pretty much the first time, and we talk about that. If they know their diagnosis, that's fine, but I encourage them to understand their illnesses and, and the medication so when they leave here, they can continue their treatment. I'm not doing therapy about mental illness, but it's important and it's a part of helping them to build uh, coping skills and have a better understanding. Yeah, right. You know, we, we talk about it as it's related to healing from trauma, and part of that is, is taking care of themselves. You know, I have a lot of clients who have never stayed on medication when they're in the community, and I try to help them plan how they can take care of themselves you know, once they're released and, and, and if they truly need the medication, that, you know, it's something that's helping manage their illness and it will help them have more control of their lives, which ultimately helps them to continue to heal from their trauma. Many of them have turned to drugs or alcohol or, or dangerous coping mechanisms before and helping them see how those things hurt them, again, as related to the trauma is a, is a big part of the sessions. Just like Jamie said, very few, if any of them, have really had the opportunity to have counseling services before their counseling sessions with us. I think that connection is really important because we know that so many people who are incarcerated um, do have a mental illness and often a severe mental illness. Um, so it certainly has, has um, would impact your, your uh, sessions. But I think that's, um, I'm glad to hear how you've worked through it. Um, can you give us an example of how you've worked through um, other challenges with a client, Eleanor? Well, I also work at a different facility called Metro West Detention, and I was a little nervous when I had my first client there because the where the setup it at, the, the setup I was pretty far away from the correction staff, and the inmates in in that jail don't have to be handcuffed. It's it's 
very huge tail. It's about the size of two football fields back to back. And I remember that when I met my first client there, I, I realized he had a pretty severe mental health issue. He was very excitable. He you know, kept standing up. He wanted to show me how much weight he had lost. And he kept lifting up his shirt. I, I gave him a piece of, you know, a, a handout about um, rape trauma symptoms. And I remember he tore it up because he said he couldn't read it. So he, he definitely took a, a little bit of getting used to. And uh, by the third session, I remember I just laid it out to him and said, listen, you know, I think we both feel comfortable now, and I'm kind of getting a, a little understanding of how you, you know, what you're like. And I told him I needed to set some limits with him, such as he needed to sit down during the, during the session, and it wasn't necessary for him to lift up his shirt to show me his weight loss, that he could just tell me about it, and, and that I would believe him. And I also started working with him on about his tone of voice and how excitable he got when we talked, and kind of pointed out to him that, you know, if he interacted with the correction officers that way, how his tone of voice and his, his excitation could, could potentially get him into, you know, some difficult situations with them. So we began to work on that in the sessions, and, you know, I, we practiced relaxation techniques, which he really liked. And uh, you know, I gave him feedback and, and guidance about how his behavior impacts reactions from, you know, others around him. And, uh, you know, by the end, uh, he was really responsive, and it's been, been very successful. That's a, uh, I think that's a really great example, um, Eleanor, about just kind of the common sense things you can do to de-escalate um, an, an inmate or a survivor and kind of help them understand how their behavior could really um, impact, have a negative impact on their environment So, and others in their environment. Um, and it just illustrates how important it is to treat inmates just like you would seeing someone in the community. You know, you, you get an understanding for what their situation is, their kind of, their environment and how they can, um, how they can cope, um, recognizing their signs of trauma, obviously. Um, so that I know that a lot of times advocates will need to advocate for their client's safety um, to the facility staff. Um, Janie and Eleanor, can you give us an example of a time when you had to advocate for one of your clients? I'm sure. I was working with a woman inmate who had a history of sexual abuse. She told me that sometimes some of the male correction officers would just open the door and come in her room in the middle of the night. But she thought they were supposed to announce themselves before coming in. That was really triggering for her because of her past abuse. The officers didn't sexually abuse her or harass her, but she felt a little violated. I told her that I didn't know the policy, the facility policy, but I will go and speak with the lieutenant and find out. I reassured her that I wouldn't tell them that she was the one who was asking. I made sure to get her permission first. It turned out that the officers are supposed to announce themselves, and the lieutenant said that he would speak with his staff. The next week when I saw the client, she said that the male officers were now announcing, male on the floor, <laughs> and she knew that I had spoken with the lieutenant. Um, she said that she felt safer and more secure. Yeah, we, we do a lot of advocating, you know, just letting the, the inmates know what their rights are. Um, for instance, if, if someone is on medication when they get released from jail, they have access to at least one week's worth of meds before getting connected to their community mental health clinic. Uh, you know, I want them to know that they can still get meds. I want them to know that there are rape crisis services in the community that they can get access to. And if a client needs to see the nurse or needs other referrals, we, we try to make that happen. Survivors have lots of needs, and we, and we can't meet all of them, but we can offer referrals and advocacies uh, to help them along the way. Thank you for that reminder, um, Eleanor and Jamie. Um, Jamie, I think that was a great example. You know, we know that prisoners don't have a lot of resources, you know, like people in the com unlike people in the community, they don't usually have many people who will listen to them. And so I think understanding that as advocates, we'll likely get some of these kind of off-topic requests, like um, providing you know, legal or help with their cases on legal help or, um, you know, help with food or whatever. And so, you know, we do what we can, but it's also important to know that, um, know who at the facility you can refer them to, which I know that the two of you have talked to me about before. So this is quite a new population, I think, for most advocates who are listening in. Um, what about some tips for working with incarcerated survivors specifically? 
You know, I think it's important um, not to talk about why they are there and or why um, or look into why they're locked up. Working in the community, we wouldn't do that or we, uh, we wouldn't have the information. We usually have no idea who's walking into our office. It's so important to treat incarcerated people the same way. Also, some of my clients in the jail um, have pretty short attention spans, so I try to redirect them. We do a lot of therapeutic exercises, and I give them handouts and homework sometimes. Inmates in the jail have a thousand other things going on, and so being able to practice redirecting um, them is very important. This is very new information for most of our clients. They haven't learned this before. We go over the resources that are available to them in the community. Many don't know there are agencies that can give them the help they need. We developed a resource guide for their areas. The guide includes mental health agencies, shelters, food banks, all of the things they will need to get back on their feet. I usually give it, um, give it to them a week or two before release, which gives us opportunity to review and discuss their plan of action after release, along with discussing and identifying their support system. You know, I would say that they are some of the most grateful clients I've ever had. They always do their homework, and they're blown away when I come to see them. It's, it's, it's very rewarding and for us that they, they are able to stay so engaged in the therapy services. Thank you for those really helpful tips. And, you know, it's, it's nice to, to hear that, um, that these are some of the most grateful clients that you've had because it's, I mean, we've definitely found that working in the field. So thank you. Um, we see people who've gone through trauma having difficult having difficulty with day to day life behind bars. Um, it makes that makes people nervous. If a corrections officer is nervous with dealing with people who are unstable, it could really escalate and possibly get out of hand. Um, they may not necessarily understand where a survivor is coming from. But I know um, Jamie and Eleanor and, and all of you listening, by your presence and talking to people, you're also training staff to recognize trauma and to not overreact. Um, so Jamie and Eleanor, have you noticed a shift in attitude in this way by staff at, at the MDCR facilities? Um, yes, definitely. I was approached by an officer who said that when he first met me, he thought I was just this touchy-feely advocate. But then he said he had a situation with an inmate where he thought about me and he thought about being more compassionate. It was very rewarding. I know that our presence there is really changing things. I hope that other agencies and therapists are interested in providing these kind of services also. If we can help trauma victims while they're behind bars, I think we can help stop the cycle. There are so many benefits for providing these services. Yes, uh, you know, the officers have definitely gotten used to us. We've had to be patient and understand and respect that this is their territory. And I want to make sure that clients get services, and we try to make sure not to upset the system in any way uh, to make that process easier for them while still being clear that we are there as advocates for, for survivors. Thank you so much, Eleanor and Jamie. Um, it really was wonderful to hear about, um, hear how you've worked with incarcerated survivors in Miami and handled what, you know, are some real challenges and inspired hope, but also inspiring hope and healing for survivors who would not have received help if not for you. So thank you so much for your work. Um, and uh, I'm sure we'll have plenty of questions for you um, in a little bit during our Q&A. So I will circle back with you then. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, so we'd love to hear from, from you all. I hope that Eleanor and Jamie's experience have given, experiences um, have given you some things to think about and maybe have inspired you to think about how you can work with incarcerated survivors. Um, so thinking about what they described, survivors you may have heard from and the opportunities for healing, we'd love to hear about what you might be most excited about or looking forward to regarding providing in-person services to survivors behind bars. Is there something that you were particularly worried about that you maybe you expressed at the beginning of this webinar um, that you now feel more motivated to do or to work through? Um, please submit your answers in the questions box. So I'm getting um, just a few. Um, 
I now feel better about uh, my own safety. I feel like the, the staff are going to um, really take care of me while I'm there. Reaching people that otherwise would not get help is awesome. Providing services to those that have probably been the most victimized by the least served and the least served. Um, all right. Well, these are great. And I have uh, I've worked with inmates, building the relationships with other service providers is so important. Thanks so much for just encouraging having conversations with facility staff about creating policies as we provide services. That's great. Um, the rewarding feeling of helping people who often feel powerless. Definitely. We've, I'm sure Eleanor and Jamie and Linda can all talk, um, kind of have all felt that way as well. Being able to assist people who feel they have no, no one to speak up for them. Absolutely. I'm happy to make a difference. The inmates really look forward to me coming every week. Oh, that's really great to hear. Um, so thank you so much, and uh, I'm glad, and I hope I hope that what we've we've talked about today has really um, get gotten you more excited, or get is getting you more excited to do this work. Um, so I'd like to turn to some of your questions, um, and I'm going to just unmute all of our all of our speakers. Um, let's see. We have a question for Linda, and I think this is, we covered this in our webinar, Hope Behind Bars, but I think, um, you know, a lot of people are asking about, um, could you talk, someone asked, could you talk about preventative measures that we can suggest to inmates? In other words, ways, ways that inmates who sense they may be a victim to keep themselves safe within the walls of the prison. Sure. I mean, I think... If you're speaking to someone who's already uh, incarcerated and they're nervous, they've been threatened, um, I, obviously one of the first things to do is, is there anyone at the facility that they feel safe talking to? Is there is there someone that they feel like they could report this threat um, to? One of the requirements of the Prison Rape Elimination Act standards is that facilities be prepared to step in to safeguard someone who reports that they are fear that they're an imminent threat of sexual abuse. So this is something facilities sh are supposed to be preparing to do. Obviously, if someone if someone feels unsafe making a report to security staff or custody staff, I think a next step would be are there any other staff members, um, medical mental health staff, anyone else that you feel like you could reach out to. Of course, understanding that if it's a serious threat, that that person will probably be also required to report it. I think next steps are to brainstorm with that person possible red flags that the situation is getting more serious um, and maybe talk about what what's the threshold that the danger level is is greater than the fear of reporting and, and maybe talk that through with the person. But then finally getting to know where they live. Do they have the freedom that say for example there's another inmate or prisoner that they feel very safe with um, and they can sort of stick with a friend for a little bit. Um, I remember one person that I worked with ended up, he, he would end up spending a lot of time in the library and he was at a prison where he had the, the ability to do that um, or if they have a job to potentially request some extra time at work. So that there may be some freedom within um, their schedule that they have to remove themselves from that situation. Another solution that some prisoners that we've worked with have taken is to actually request that they be moved to a protective custody unit and depending on the facility as well, sometimes that can be requested without giving a specific report of the person who's threatened them. So I think similar to safety planning with clients in the community, run through what possible options are thinking that there may be things because that person's in crisis they haven't thought about, like for example the client I worked with who ended up going to the library to do more research on a regular basis um, because the library staff would be observing them at that point um, and they felt safe there. So brainstorm those options with them and come up with a clear plan um, about who and what they can reach out to and where they can be to keep safe. Great. Um, 
Our next question, I think I'd love to hear, um, Eleanor and Jamie, what you your what your experience has been. Um, let's see, hold on. <laughs> um, how do we educate officers that work in the facility so that they understand the confidentiality of the inmate, especially when the rape may not have happened in their facility? Eleanor or Jamie, do you want to talk about your experience kind of generally educating um, kind of the staff at uh, MDCR and also when you've talked, how and, and how you've talked to them about confidentiality? You know, this is Jamie. I find that, um, like I said, a lot of the um, officers are very, very eager to, you know, to kind of work with us. So what I try to do is build rapport with officers, and then when they see me speaking or meeting with the um, client, and they have questions, they do come and talk to me about, well, suppose if the inmate is doing this, how do I handle that? Or, you know, what is he saying or what is she saying to you back there? And then that's when I just kind of educate them about the dynamics of confidentiality and about uh, the dynamics of giving, um, having a, um, inmates know their rights and have a better understanding of how the inmates might feel. And then also, too, when we talk about things that have happened there in the past prior to coming to jail, you know, expect like them understanding the dynamics of victimization and the dynamics of sexual abuse and how it can impact, um, you know, the inmate's life from the big childhood to adulthood. So I guess it's keeping open rapport with the uh, correction officers and the facilities. Mm -hmm. And I know also that in the beginning of J or ongoing, JDI has done training with the correction officers in Miami just kind of educating them about you know, confidentiality and about sexual abuse and about rape and, and how they can respond and, you know, what our role is within the facilities. And that kind of goes back about the officer that, um, you know, kind of identified me as a touchy-feely person. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah, you're that touchy-feely lady. <laughs> so that's an example of it. That's great. I think that's, um, you know, it's really nice to hear about what you're doing in the field. <laughs> um, Let's see, the next question, how can we make it where our staff is at the corrections facility regularly instead of just when corrections staff contact us? Um, Linda, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. I mean, and I think Jamie and Eleanor do the same thing, sort of have a schedule. Um, again, when I was doing work at the, the prison where I, where I did counseling, I basically had a set day of the week that I went up, and so if I... I didn't have a set appointment for an hour. I could take a walk in um, if so, if something had come up, or or go meet with facility staff that I needed to discuss some issues with. So I think that um, that was another way that we were able to protect the confidentiality of people who didn't want to report was that someone could sort of come by and ask me a question. And again, that a lot of that really depends on the setup of the facility where you're at, right? I'm talking about I was doing um, services on a large prison yard where prisoners had some freedom of movement um, throughout their day, whereas at many, for example, jails like, you know, where both Jamie and Eleanor provide services, um, inmates don't have freedom of movement, you know, from cell to cell or outside of their unit. So, but they, you still can decide that I'm there, you know, every Wednesday or something like that, absolutely. Um, and that way you can see people a little more easily, sort of on an emergency basis. Yes, like at TGK, I'm there on Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. So usually when I go on a regular basis, they kind of know what day and what time to expect me of entering the floor. If yeah. by chance that that floor is closed down or something is going on on that floor, I just go on to the next unit or the next floor. And mm -hmm. then if in between clients, I might check in with um, lieutenant or the front office administration or the clinic just to make sure there are any questions or any referrals or anything I need to follow up on. So I'm kind of there on three or four days a week so they kind of know what days that I'm going to be there. So when they see me, they you know, know that I'm going to be there. So I have a set mm -hmm. schedule that I go mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Great. And then, so here's kind of a more, another pra more practical question. How much time, someone asked, how much time should I spend with my client? Um, and maybe Jamie or Eleanor, do you want to talk about kind of do you, what you guys provide? Do you have a set amount of time? Do you, is, are they longer sometimes because of X or Y reason? 
Um, on average, uh, you know, it's just like a, a regular therapy session. It's, it's 50 minutes and um, during the session. And, uh, you know, if, if there's a crisis or anything, then, of course, we would go over it. If, if, if our client is having some kind of issue or something else is going on that requires um, extra time, and I know that Jamie's had some situations that she's dealt with that she can probably talk about where she's actually seen her clients, you know, uh, twice in a week because of things that were going on that really required that. But it's, mm -hmm. it's you know, the average therapy session. And also, too, um, like we might, like a, a, for an example, if they are, are if they are getting ready to be released within a day or two and we're going over the resource guide, the support system, and just kind of identifying, working with them, um, that what their fears are, what, you know, what are they worried about, what are their thoughts mm -hmm. about being released. Because some of them have been there for a while and some of them have fear about going back to the community, mm -hmm. back to the same neighborhood, back to the same environment, and the triggers that are there. So those sessions, usually the last session, I kind of take a little bit more time um, to just kind of go over and just kind of make them feel a little bit more comfortable and, and address some of the issues that they might have. Um, also, too, if you know, if I know that a client has a very short attention span, um, then I notice that if they're the conversation is getting a little overwhelmed, or they are a little more tired, or they just kind of seem distracted. At that time, I'll go, okay, well, we'll you know end today. Um, I'll see you next week. So that time, I might shorten the sessions based on the person's attention span or kind of what, what they're feeling that day. Great. Um, here is an interesting question, um, and any of one of you can chime in. Um, we do not meet survivors face-to-face, -face, but behind glass. How would you suggest using the informed consent form um, and gaining their signature? It generally takes two to three weeks for the inmates to receive any mail from us. Um, I had that situation. I, I had a client who um, had been placed in the secure housing unit after the reporting and assault uh, essentially was determined for his, his own protection and um, and we had a choice of meeting um, either with him in a, in a small holding cell or behind visitor glass and I left that up to him and he chose the in the visiting unit behind glass and um, and so what I actually did was I, I have a the point, the point person that I was working with, um, I was able to give my forms to him, and he handed them directly to the client, and then we talked them through um, when he was behind the glass, and then um, we then I I got the back with the signature, but I would think depending on what your requirements are, another option you could you could have if man if you don't have that kind of relationship with your contact person that I did, um, of, of sort of trust that that was a possible thing to do, would be to, if you have the window, you can hold the papers up to the window and review them in detail verbally um, and get a verbal acknowledgement and then also mail them a hard copy. That, that would be my suggestion. I don't know if mm -hmm. Jamie or Eleanor, you have any other thoughts about that? I would yeah. agree, holding it up to the glass and going over it in detail and um, then following up, sending them the hard copy. That's what I would suggest. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so our next question, um, someone is asking about outreach tools to um, prison, local prison. Um, they're a rape crisis center who sent letters to the prison or jail and they have not received any response. Linda, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, sure. I mean, thinking about that, that one of the things that they're required to do at this point is to make an attempt to enter an agreement with a local rape crisis program who can provide emotional support. And so if you've sent a letter, I, mean, I think my next thing would be to find out if you haven't already, and you may have specifically, who is the Prison Rape Elimination Act coordinator? at the facility and direct it directly to either them or the, the warden potentially. Um, and I would refer to the, the Prison Rape Elimination Act standards in your, um, 
in your uh, letter saying that you know that they're at this time probably looking for an organization who can provide emotional support services per the Prison Rape Elimination Act standards and that you are willing to talk with them about your agency providing those services. Um, I mean, I think again for them that requirement to become in compliance with those standards is probably the most compelling thing and I would definitely refer back to that. But I would make sure you, if you can find the PREA Prison Rape Elimination Act coordinator at the facility. Because others, if you send it to the warden, I mean, there may honestly be people at the facility who don't even know. Right. Um, great point. Any, Jamie or Eleanor? Um, no, I have no comment on it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, I thought Linda, I think Linda said it. Yeah, she yeah. Yes. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, so someone is asking, okay, so we're also concerned about how we can respond to individuals who reach out to us from prison with special needs um, or, peop or, tra or transgender clients. How can we learn about the current resources available to them? And I, any of you, if you have any ideas or want to reflect, uh, share some, an experience you've had, um, well, that was when uh, one of the clients I recently have had within the last month, actually I've, ha I've had two in the last month that are transgender um, clients. And um, a lot of information is not available out there. So what I did was when um, I spoke with Eleanor and I have developed a resource guide. So with this resource guide, I've um, uh, contacted a local um, organization that um, provides services to transgender and I you know got the locations the groups all the information that the inmate the client would need uh, be upon release and then that um, the client that was released was able to contact the organization and follow through with the services um, so that's what I, I guess I will contact any agency in the area who provides services to that population and find out more about the services and get handouts and then I would you know take it back to the inmate and share it with the inmate so when upon his release he can contact, contact the organizations and continue services. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Um, our next question. How do we go about working with those facilities in collaborating to provide the proper healing services without making the facilities feel like we're stepping over their boundaries? I don't know if any of you want to talk about, or Linda, if you want to talk about that more generally, and Jamie and Eleanor, maybe talk about how you've got, gotten around that, <laughs> if you have. Sure. I mean, I think that, again, that, that because of the Prison Rape Elimination Act, a lot of facilities are, are essentially re required and um, and I've found many to be quite happy to work with us. And I think the, the, the fear or concern that the corrections have said about stepping on their toes or the boundaries has been more if they perceive that, that I see them all as you know, bad people or that we don't have the same goals. And I think, again, sort of building those relationships that we all have the same goal of people that are to be safe and people who need help to get the help that they need. Um, that's really been kind of, again, building that relationship and um, and sort of my consistent, and I think both Jamie and Eleanor as well, consistent sort of presence of, I'm here to be helpful, I'm, I'm here to help you get something done you need to get done, and also I meet my goals as an advocate because I'm providing services to survivors. And so I just really think it's all about building that relationship. And, and again, right now you all have the Prison Rape Elimination Act behind you that very strongly supports this relationship with outside advocacy organizations that you can fall back on. Yeah, you know, and I just want to add that, you know, really um, our, our goals are kind of the same because mm -hmm. we want to help our, our clients in, in the facilities and and helping them really helps the correction officers and all, all the ones that, that run the jails because we're providing a service um, that keeps, that helps their mental health. And by helping their mental health and helping them deal with the trauma, then they will be uh, maybe triggered less or, or, or respond to their triggers in a different way so that they don't cause problems for the officers. And so maybe they'll have a calmer floor. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, really great point. So our next question, um, what can you do if a private space, a meeting space, is not or cannot be provided? Linda, do you want to take that? Or anyone? <laughs> sure. I would. I would go back to what are the reasons for that. I mean, it is. 
it's hard to imagine that there would be a facility where there is absolutely no private space available at all. I'm not saying in a very small facility that couldn't be the case, but I've certainly, I've been in probably hundreds of corrections facilities and I've never seen that. There's, they have to provide it. There's an attorney meeting room. Mm -hmm. There's a medical interview room. There's an office. Um, I worked in one prison where I met with my clients in um, the boardroom. Um, obviously, they were, you know, lower security, so it was fine. Um, if if there is zero meeting space, I think, you know, I think it was Eleanor who mentioned earlier doing that kind of decision tree about, okay, I don't really want to meet with clients who are shackled to a wall, but if I don't do that, these survivors don't get services. And I think, so what's the reason? Is it because they, they're saying they actually don't have a, a room? So I'd say, well, where do attorneys meet with people? Or where do medical providers or mental health providers meet with people? Um, is there a classroom that's not being used? And if they say, no, we're a small facility, we, we actually don't, you know, attorneys only meet by phone and we don't, and medical providers see people in the hallway, you know, if that is the case, um, then, I would make the decision of, okay, well, where medical providers see people is, is, does that provide enough privacy at all that I feel like ethically I can still provide some, some support to people, even if it's not as deep? Um, and if it's a case where they're saying that because of the security level of the person, that no, there's no way you can meet privately with, with that person, I think that's where the person who asked earlier about the in-the-glass non-contact visiting room, um, mentioned that, or maybe if there's a private phone uh, line they could use that they use to call those attorneys, maybe you could set up a phone session. So um, I would both push that a little bit very respectfully about, you know, really, <laughs> there's nowhere. Um, and if indeed that is the case, then um, doing that decision-making process of, okay, is it better for me to still provide some support to the survivor, um, even if it's not to, you know, kind of my Cadillac level of services, um, or, or is this not that not ethical and I'll maybe correspond with that survivor or find other way to provide them support? I don't know, Jamie or Eleanor, if you have something to add to that. Well, I, I think I just want to point out that it goes back to what you said earlier in the presentation about being flexible. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, and, uh, you know, you know, deciding, you know, what exactly, you know, you have to do in order to provide that service for the client that is still ethical. Um, and there have been times when I have gone to the facilities that I work at when when I have not been able to go up on the floor because there were no rooms available or there was a situation. And, you know, I just patiently waited and, until uh, something did come up because, uh, you know, when you know that your client is expecting you and, and they're waiting for this one time for the mm -hmm. week, um, you know, I kind of schedule into my time that, you know, I never know when I go to the jails what's going to be happening. There was just one day, um, Sunday, I, I, I was not able to get up on one of the floors, and I tried several times all day, and uh, and it was because, you know, they'd had a, an incident and the floor was locked down. So a situation like that, you know, so, I you know, I, I'm flexible, and I'm going to go back another day this week to see the person that I missed because I only missed one person. And so you, you kind of work around and do what you have to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would like to add also, too, it has a lot to do with uh, building the rapport, establishing relationships at the facilities. Um, because I know the times I go, when I first started out, I would go and you know meet with lieutenants and introduce myself to people in the hallway, introduce myself to the correction officers. So, you know, without breaking confidentiality in regards to the client, but just them having a better understanding of why I'm there and a common goal. And, you know, it's, it's you know, and the thing is that we want to make sure these people, you know, leave here and, and really not come back. Um, mm -hmm. So how can we work together so we can improve their life and also to improve your safety and your time that you have the um, inmates in your presence so every, everything can be peaceful and calm. calm. But I think that has a lot to do with establishing rapport and building relationships mm -hmm. with the facilities um, and the workers and the correction officers and administration so they can, you can build a rapport with them. I think that helps a lot with, you know, in situations when they, they don't have any spaces. They, at that point in time, they'll try to, you know, accommodate you more because they have a better understanding of what you, why you're there and your purpose. 
Thank you so much. I think that's, you know, all really helpful, I hope. Um, So I think that's all the time we have for questions today. Um, If we didn't get to your question, um, please email us um, at advocate at justdetention.org. So much of what we discussed today is included in um, our JDI publication called Hope Behind Bars, an advocate's guide to helping survivors of sexual abuse behind bars, um, pictured here on the screen. This guide is free and can be found on the Advocate Resources page of of JDI's website, and I sent that link out to everyone a little bit earlier. Um, We certainly encourage you all to download the guide for future reference and to share it with your colleagues. and so if you have any questions or technical su- or, or need technical support, you can always contact us again at advocate at justattention.org and we'll get back to you within two business days. Um, and we also encourage you to visit the Advocate Resources page. The link is up here on your screen for more archived webinars on a variety of topics, working in rural jails, in police lockups, in um, large prisons, working with different populations. Um, And then we also have different fact sheets um, and then tools like the sample MOUs we talked about and the forms we went over today. Um, And that link is is just up here. Um, JDI also has a resource guide for survivors of sexual abuse behind bars. Um, It's it's a guide that lists legal and psychological counseling resources by state for survivors who are still incarcerated, those who have been released, and loved ones on the outside who are searching for ways to help. And we get contacted by all of these groups of people constantly. We receive about 2,000 letters um, and and lots of phone calls um, a year. So if your agency is interested in being listed on our resource guide, um, please fill out the form found at the link right here. It's the bit.ly link on your screen, um, and we'll include We'll also include the link in a follow-up email, which you'll get, you'll receive later today. Um, and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, please take a moment to complete the evaluation and provide us with your feedback. Um, we take it very seriously. We have a lot of webinars um, in the next few years, and we really want to make them as useful for all of you as possible. So the evaluation link is up here on your screen, and you'll also receive it in an email shortly. Thank you so much. Um, again, our resources, all of that information is up on your screen, um, and we So we really invite you to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter for more opportunities um, to take action and more survivor stories um, and lots more. So thanks again and have a wonderful day.